The Spiritual Doctrine of Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity by M. M. Philippon, Order of Preachers Translated by a Benedictine of Stanbrook Abbey Published by the Newman Press, Westminster, Maryland, in 1951 Preface this mystery of the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in the depths of her soul was the great reality of her interior life. Garagou Larange The most elementary truths of Christian faith, such as those expressed in Our Father, are, we find, the most profound truths we have meditated upon them long and lovingly when through the years we have lived with them while carrying our cross and they have become the object of almost continuous contemplation to be led to the heights of sanctity it would be enough for a soul to live intensely but one of these truths of our faith one of the most important of these truths is that of the special presence of god in the souls of the just according to the words of our Lord, If any one love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. John 14.23 By these words, and by the promise of the Holy Spirit, Christ taught us the most fundamental vocation of every baptized soul is to live in fellowship with the very persons of the Blessed Trinity. Hence, according to St. Thomas's frequently repeated words, the Christian life here on earth is, in a sense, eternal life begun. The grace of baptism makes us truly partakers of the divine nature even as it subsists in the bosom of the Trinity. God has so loved us in his Son as to will to make us share in the very principle of his intimate life, the principle of the immediate vision he has of himself, which he communicates to the Word and to the Holy Ghost. Thus the just enter into the family of God and into the life cycle of the Trinity. Living faith, enlightened by the gift of wisdom, assimilates them to the light of the Word. Infused charity assimilates them to the Holy Spirit. In them the Father begets His Word. In them the Father and Son breathe the personal love that unites them. In each of them the Trinity dwells, whole and entire, as in a living temple. Here below it dwells as in a darkened temple, but in heaven in a light that knows no shadow, and in an unchanging love. The servant of God, Elizabeth of the Trinity, was one of those enlightened and heroic souls able to cling to one of these great truths, which are both the simplest and the most important, and beneath the appearance of an ordinary life, to find therein the secret of a very close union with God. This mystery of the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in the depths of her soul was the great reality of her interior life. As she herself said, The Trinity, there is our dwelling home, the Father's house that we must never leave. It seems to me that I have found my heaven on earth, for heaven is God, and God is in my soul. On the day I understood that, everything became clear to me. Obviously, the foundation of this supernatural life is the practice of the theological virtues. Faith is supernatural light through which we receive the revelation of this divine world. Our hope, upheld by the omnipotence of God, whose hand is ever stretched out to help us, enables us to tend surely towards eternal happiness. Charity establishes us permanently in the friendship and fellowship of the divine persons, 
according to the teaching of St. John the Evangelist, God is charity, and when he that abideth in charity abideth in God, and God in him. 1 John 4.16 In essence, there is but one supernatural life. It begins on earth with our baptism, and it will reach its full development in her heaven with the vision of, the, of God face to face. Faith is the root of all this new activity. It is the substance, the principle, the germ of things hoped for, things which we shall one day behold unveiled. The least light of faith is thus infinitely superior to the natural intuitions of the greatest genius and the highest angel. It belongs to the same essentially supernatural order as the beatific vision. Living faith, enlightened by the gifts of understanding and wisdom, is, accordingly, the only light proportionate to this life of intimate communion with the divine persons. Hence, above all else, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity stands before us as a soul in faith, living in ever more perfect communion with the invisible world while, under the hand of God, sense and spirit were being purified through the events of her daily life. Like a true daughter of St. John of the Cross, she was aware of the primary importance of faith in the supernatural life. In order to draw near to God, she wrote, we must believe. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things that appear not. St. John of the Cross says that it serves us as feet to go to God, that it is in that it is in possession of an obscure manner. It alone can give us real light upon him whom we love. Our soul should choose it by means of watching the blessed union. Without neglecting the practice of the moral virtues, she was seen to apply herself more and more to the interior activity of the theological virtues. My only practice is to enter into myself and lose myself in those who are there. The perfect flowering of faith, hope, and charity demands special assistance from God, and it is precisely by an increasingly predominant activity of the gifts of the Holy Ghost that the mystical life is characterized. Although the theological virtues are actually superior to the gifts that accompany them, they receive a new perfection from the gifts, just as a tree is more perfect with its fruit than without it. According to St. Thomas, a soul that only imperfectly possesses a principle of action cannot act as it should unless it is helped by a higher agent. In the spiritual life, the beginner needs the guidance of an experienced master, just as a student of medicine or surgery needs the direction of his professor. Now, by means of the theological and moral virtues, the just man as yet possesses only imperfectly this divine, gra divine life of grace, which introduces him into the family of the Trinity. Hence, the divine persons must themselves come to his aid, according to St. Paul's words to the Romans, whoever is led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8.14 He must live not in the manner of a human creature, but in God's manner, in the intimacy of the divine persons, in order that he may be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. How is anyone to judge of all things, both human and divine, after the manner of God himself, unless divine knowledge and wisdom are specially imparted to him? In the midst of the frequently insoluble situations of human life, 
How is he to make a swift decision that will coincide with the plan of divine providence without a special operation of the gift of counsel? Finally, how is he to remain immutably attached to the divine will amid the difficulties, at times terrible difficulties, of life, without the special assistance of the divine fortitude itself, which alone can triumph over all the powers of evil? In the manifestation of these gifts of the Holy Ghost in the world of souls, however, the greatest variety is apparent, according to the circumstances in which God places them and according to their mission. The intellectual gifts are more readily discerned in some souls, in others the gifts of fear, piety, and fortitude. There is an infinite range of subtle distinctions. Even the same gift assumes diverse forms in the different saints. As in some, as in St. Augustine, wisdom appears primarily in a contemplative form. In others, as in St. Vincent de Paul, it appears as a practical form, wholly given to the works of mercy. To the former, the Holy Ghost gives the ability to penetrate and to savor the deep things of God, to speak of them in glowing terms. He makes the latter see, as in a diffused light, the suffering members of Christ, and means by which they may work effectively for their salvations. In the case of the servant of God considered in these pages, we are impressed by the high degree of her possession of the gifts of understanding and wisdom, by means of which she was able to penetrate so deeply into the mystery of the Trinity, and to feel its effects profoundly and almost continuously. Even before she entered Carmel, it was obvious that she was powerfully gripped by the presence of the divine persons in the depth of her soul. Towards the end of her life, on the Feast of the Ascension, the last time she celebrated this feast on earth, she felt the Blessed Trinity take possession of her soul to such a degree that she seemed to see the divine persons holding their counsel of love in her. From that day on, whenever any special intention was recommended to her prayers, she would answer, I will speak of it to my almighty counsel. On the eve of her death, she could write in all truth, The belief that a being, whose name is love, is dwelling in us at every moment of the day and night, and that he asks us to live in his company, that I own to you is what has made my life an anticipated heaven. We were also deeply struck at seeing the degree to which she had received the gift of fortitude. It is constantly noticeable in the heart of which the servant of God accepted the hardest of trials, particularly during her illness. Unable to practice extraordinary mortifications, which obedience to her superior forbade throughout her religious life, she bore unflinchingly during a long and very trying year of novitiate the painful passive purifications that were inevitable for a still too keenly sensitive character. She bravely walked the road of the dark night, more and more seeking refuge in pure faith, and never ceasing to lift herself up to God, beyond all his graces and all his gifts. But it was particularly during her last illness that her gift of fortitude revealed itself in its splendor. While her physical frame was being destroyed, her soul remained steadfast under the most crucifying divine purifications. She rose above the actual suffering so that, through joy and suffering alike, she may think only of her office as being a praise of glory of the Trinity. 
She thought of the majesty with which the Christ the King, crowned with thorns, went to Calvary, and it is a reflection of that majesty which we find in this valiant bride of the Saviour, who worked with him, through him, and in him, and by the same means, means as he, for the salvation of souls. Truly did God grant her last wish, to die not only as pure as an angel, but transformed into Christ crucified. Finally, one of the most characteristic features of the spiritual physiognomy of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity is obviously her doctrinal sense. Nourished at the best sources of Christian thought were her two favorite teachers, St. Paul, the Apostle of the Mystery of Christ, and St. John of the Cross, the mystical doctor of Carmel. Without being a theologian in the formal sense of the word, yet, like a true daughter of St. Teresa, she had a taste for solid doctrine, which she made the substantial food of her interior life, delighting to ponder the great truths of faith in silence and prayer under the light of life, which increases us as we grow in love of God and of souls. Hence, the author's task was twofold. First, to set forth, in the light of the guiding principles of mystical theology, the essential movements of this contemplative soul, and to distinguish the fundamental truths by which the servant of God lived, according to her special grace, under a Carmelite form. Secondly, after having noted the principal stages of her ascension, to bring out the points of doctrine which particularly nour nourished her spiritual life, that is, the excesses of silence, the indwelling of the Trinity, the praise of glory, conformity to Christ, and her very personal devotion to Our Lady of the Incarnation. The operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in her, and finally the profound meaning of her celebrated prayer to the Holy Trinity of her mission. Father Marie Michel Philippon wrote these pages after long meditation on the lights and life and writings of Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity. For several years he had been truly penetrated with them and he sought to explain them in the light of the principles of theology as formulated by St. Thomas and applied to the direction of contemplative souls by St. John of the Cross. He has fulfilled his task with both reverence and a sense of doctrine that altogether made it possible for him to combine supernatural enthusiasm with a right moderation a balance difficult to maintain, especially in cases where the servant of God was called upon to practice simultaneously virtues that appear contrary to one another, fortitude and gentleness, prudence and simplicity, compassion for the erring and sinners, and ardent zeal for the glory of God. The reader will draw great profit from this clear-sighted and profound study which concretely and vividly reveals the theology of the grace of the virtue of gifts by displaying the riches it contains. May the Blessed Trinity find in this book a new ray of glory, and may those who read it draw from it the true humility that is so closely connected with the theological virtues, which, in turn, Reveal to us the meaning of the higher things. So many poor human beings, made for eternal life and the fellowship of divine persons, drag out their lives in the sterile, restless activity of a topsy-turvy world. God grant that some of them may find in these pages the bearings to chart their course, and to regain the right road which leads to union with God, to the light of life, which enlightens everything from on high by showing us the one thing necessary, the end for which we are destined. 
Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, Order of Preachers. From Rome, the Angelico, July 12, 1937. Chapter 1 Spiritual Journey A Carmelite and everything she bears the mark of this predestination. Before we seek to sound analytically the depths of this soul, one general remark is called for. Elizabeth of the Trinity became a saint only after eleven years of struggle and constant retouching of details. Even after she had entered Carmel and had spent several years of silently faithful religious life, it remained for her to undergo, at the hands of God, those purifications by which he brings heroic souls to the unchanging peace of this transforming union, above all joy and all suffering. One. Interior Life in the World As a daughter and granddaughter of soldiers, Elizabeth K. Tez bore in her veins the quickly roused blood of warriors. She inherited a fiery temperament. When not more than three or four years old, she once shut herself into a room of the family dwelling and stamped and raged behind the door, kicking that offending bulwark furiously all the while. Until she was seven, these violent outbursts marked her childhood. It was impossible to control them. There was nothing to do but wait for the storm to subside of itself. Then her mother reasoned with her and taught her to overcome herself through love. That child has a will of iron, her teacher would say. She is determined to have what she wants. She was but a child when her father died in her arms and left her with her only mother and sister Marguerite. Marguerite was a gentle and retiring girl and Elizabeth shared every hour of her life with her until her interest, entrance into Carmel. Undisturbed by any other serious event, life flowed along in Dijon in happy Christian fashion. Her first confession wrought a change in Elizabeth's soul, which she later called her conversion, a shock which caused a complete awakening with respect to the things of God. From that day forward she resolutely entered upon the struggle, struggle against her predominant faults, anger and oversensitiveness. This hard phase of spiritual warfare was to last until she was eighteen. The priest who prepared her for her first communion knew her well and told an intimate friend of her mother with her temperament, Elizabeth Catez will either be a saint or a demon. This first contact with Jesus, hidden in the host, was decisive. In the depths of her soul she heard his voice. The master took possession of her heart so completely that thenceforth her one desire was to give her life to him. To the astonishment of those around her, a sudden and profound change took place in Elizabeth, and she began to make great strides towards that calm self-command which was soon to characterize her. One day, after Holy Communion, she seemed to hear the word Carmel spoken in her soul. She understood. She was only fourteen when, on another occasion, during her thanksgiving, she heard an interior call from the Master, and she instantly instantly made a vow of virginity in order to belong to him alone. She was to die faithful to that vow and as pure as a lily. Her poems, written between the ages of fourteen and nineteen, speak only the names of her beloved genius, Jesus, her heavenly mother Mary, her angel guardian, the saints, and Joan of Arc, the maid whom none can dishonor. 
Carmel had a particularly irresistible fascination for her, and her verses sing the praises of the externals of the Carmelite, the coarse serge habit, the white veil, the cheap wooden rosary, the hair shirt chastising the flesh, and, lastly, the ring worn by the Bride of Christ. As she lived very near her dear Carmel, she often went to the balcony of her room, sadly dreaming, and gazed long and fixedly at the monastery. Everything spoke to her heart, the chapel hiding the master of her life, the ringing of the Angelus, the knell for the dead, the cells with their tiny windows, the poor furniture, where the nuns rested after a long day of redemptive prayer. She was seventeen and longed for the realization of her dream, still so remote. She did try once to escape this sad, seductive world, by having a priest friend speak to her mother, but Madame Cotez could not be moved. So, in prayer, Elizabeth confidently awaited God's hour. After that attempt, she was claimed by a constant round of amusements and parties, which Madame Cotez quietly urged her to take part. Perhaps without wishing to dissuade her daughter from her vocation, she secretly cherished the hope that God would not take her from her. Nor did Elizabeth need to be urged. It was enough for her that her mother wished it. She went everywhere, and apparently always enjoyed herself. She never seemed the least bit bored, is the constant refrain of those who knew her. No one could have guessed that Elizabeth was the future Carmel Carmelite, whose intense interior life, wholly hidden within herself in Christ, was to bring to the unchanging Trinity a most moving testimony of silence and recollection. She made a beautiful figure, always simply but irreproachably dressed, and she received several offers of marriage. Typically, she bought new gloves for one of her last evening affairs, not wishing anyone to suspect her departure. She joyously took part in the social life of her circle, shunning nothing but sin. Throughout the year at Dijon, Elizabeth gave herself to good works in her parish. She helped with the choir. She taught catechism to the children and to older first communicants of little, the little girls made fun of, and did whatever else she was asked. She also had charge of a club for tough children who worked in the tobacco industry. They were so passionately fond of her that she had to conceal her address from them to keep them from overrunning her home. As Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity, she later followed their lives and protected them with a Carmelite silent prayer. With exquisite tact, Elizabeth was at home with everyone, everywhere. She loved childhood because of its innocence, and God granted her a wonderful gift of interesting youngsters. At parties for the family and friends, she sometimes had as many as forty children around her. She liked to get up tableau, particularly of Jesus in the midst of the doctors, and we find her dressing up her little company and teaching it how to act. She herself wrote both script and music for the plays, and she was especially clever at arranging children's dances. Finally, when all the excitement of the play had died down, the chairs would be set out in the garden, and she would read to them for a while. All ears, they listened to Patira. Sometimes they teased her to join in their games, and she would smilingly give in. During the month of May, the little group she took to church used to make her stay in the back as near the door as possible, and scarcely was the tabernacle closed than we would drag her off for a walk. Then she would make up wonderful stories to tell us. Elizabeth Catez always fitted into every mood. 
Let us remember this characteristic. In the cloister, as in the world, Elizabeth of the Trinity tried not to seem different from others. With the, with the rest, she appreciated the good tarts made by Francine, the best cook in Dijon, and laughed gaily at the heavy dinners typical of the south of France, which filled them to the bursting point for three days after. As the summer holidays came round, the family always left Dijon and went on long journeys. Thus Elizabeth visited Switzerland, the Alps, the Jura, the Vosges, the Pyrenees, and a considerable portion of France. Her letters show that she enjoyed herself. She was made much of in the whirling round of visits to relatives and friends, and became strongly attached to a few chosen friends. More often, however, she seemed simply to mingle in the groups of girls of her own age, having, from motives both of charity and good breeding, a happy companionship with all. Our stay at Tarbes had been nothing but a long succession of pleasures, afternoon dances and musicales, country excursions, one after the other. The people at Tarbes were are delightful. I have come to know a number of girls, each more charming than the rest. When X, who is a very good musician, and I were together, we never left the piano, and all music shops in Tarbes could not keep us supplied with pieces to play at sight. We are leaving today for Lourdes, and it breaks my heart to leave my dear Yvonne. She is the prettiest girl and a wonderful character. As for Madame X, not a trace of her illness remains. She is younger and more stunning than ever, and always so kind. The day before yesterday was my eighteenth birthday, and she gave me a lovely set of turquoise blouse studs. Write to me soon. I must leave you to finish packing. I shall be thinking of you a great deal at Lourdes, and from there we will tour the Pyrenees, going to Luchon, Cotterets, etc. I am wild over these mountains, which I am looking at while I write to you. I feel as though I could never live without them. She was especially charmed with Lancia Luchon. It deserves its name of Queen of the Pyrenees. I was more excited about it than any place. The location is incomparable. We spent two days there and were able to make the trip through the Lys Valley. We had gone out in a large landau, drawn by four horses, and were with cousins R and S, whom we had met again at Luchon. These ladies put us in charge of someone we knew, who was making the, the ascent as far as the Gaufry de Denfer. We were 1801 meters from sea level, hanging over that horrible abyss. Madeline and I thought it so beautiful that we almost wanted to whirl away in those waters, but our guide, enthusiastic as he was, felt differently. He proved to be much more cautious than we, who galloped along our edge of the precipice without feeling the least bit giddy. Our friends gave us a sigh of relief when we got back, for they had hardly felt easy about us during our escapade. Thus she hurried from one set of friends to another, enjoying the most delightful life, as she tells us herself. Lunaville was typical. Lunching here, dining there, in addition to numerous tennis parties with the most charming girls. In short, she had not a minute to herself. On the 14th of July she was present at a review at the Champ de Mars because of her family's close relationships in military circles. As befits an officer's daughter, she was thrilled by the cavalry charge. 
Just imagine all those hem helmets and cuirasses sparkling in the sun. The dazzling performance ended in the evening in the grooves of the park, with fairy-like illuminations rather resembling Venice. Yet amid these worldly amusements, in her heart she was still homesick for Carmel. As soon as the guests had left, without the slightest effort, Elizabeth was back again with the lord she had never left. At Tarbus, in order to escape for a moment from the noisy gaiety, she took refuge in the Carmelite convent that the out-sister found her kneeling by the grill in the parlor. Gladly she would have kissed every wall in that house of God. Lourdes was close by, and for three days she buried herself in recollection near Our Lady of the Rock. Holidays and social gaieties easily dropped from her mind. Wrapped in prayer, she remained motionless for a long time before the grotto, beseeching Mary Immaculate to keep her pure in her own image and offering herself as a victim for sinners. Nothing could distract from her lord. Later on, when, her car when from car her Carmel at Dijon, she would write this postscript in a letter to her mother. Do not forget to make your meditation on Friday, when you are on the train. It is a very good opportunity, as I remember. She spoke from experience. Likewise, the earthly riches of the great city she visited left her indifferent. For her, Marseilles meant Notre Dame de la Garde, and Lyons only four veries. At Paris, to which she had gone with her mother and sister for the great exposition of 1900, only two things really interested her Montmartre and Our Lady of Victories. We went to the exhibition twice. It is very fine, but I detest the noise and the crowd. Marguerite laughed at me and declared that I was like somebody just returned from the Congo. During this period of her life, she generously, her generous watchword was agendo contra. A note in her diary made when she was nineteen reads. Today I had the joy of offering Jesus several sacrifices over my dominant fault, but how much they cost me! I recognize my weakness there. When I receive an unjust reproof, I feel as though the blood is boiling in my veins. My whole being rises in revolt. But Jesus was with me. Deep down in my heart I heard his voice, and then I was ready to bear anything for love of him. In order to find out whether she was really advancing in the way of perfection, she kept a little notebook in which every evening she marked down her victories and defeats. Elizabeth tried to fast without her mother's knowledge. But the watchful Madame Catez discovered the fact in a few days and scolded her severely. Once more Elizabeth obeyed. God did not will to lead her by the way of the great mortification of the saints. It was to be the same throughout her life at Carmel. The silent trinity expected another kind of homage from her. Since I can impose almost no sufferings on myself, I must accept the realization that this physical suffering is only a means, albeit an excellent one, of attaining to interior mortification and complete detachment from self. O oh Jesus, my life, my love, my bridegroom, help me. It is absolutely necessary for me to reach that stage at which I may always and in all things do the contrary of my own will. God could not wait long to reward Elizabeth's continual efforts to triumph over her nature by secret touches of his grace. The ascetic life leads to the mystical life and constitutes its necessary safeguard. With her usual good sense, St. Teresa said, Delicate living and prayer do not go together. 
all this is quite normal. The living flame of love presupposes the painful ascent of Mark of Mount Carmel, with its dark nights and active and passive purification such as to make the most resolute tremble. We are too prone also to forget the long contemplative ecstasies of the author of the spiritual exercises in his cell at Rome, where the enraptured Ignatius murmured over and over again, O Beata Trinitas. We need not deny absolute diversities of tendencies and spiritual paths, but the scriptural truth includes all these shades, and saints of all schools meet with meet at a point beyond them all. At the summit they were all transformed into Christ, identified with the beatitude of the crucified. The spiritual combat against her faults and the triumph over her natural temperament led Elizabeth Cates to the first manifestations of those mystical graces which were to transform her life. At first slowly, and by successive touches as though step by step, then from the time of her religious profession, by a calm and continuous motion, finally in the last phase, the six months spent in the infirmary, by giant strides lifting her to the loftiest heights of transforming union. She did not become aware of these first divine touches, received during the course of a retreat in January 1899, until several months later, when she was reading the works of St. Teresa. Her diary account of the matter is one of the greatest importance in the history of her spiritual life. It marks her entrance into the mystical way after a hard spiritual struggle which lasted more than eleven years, which, in fact, was never to end. At present I am reading St. Teresa's Way of Perfection. I find it tremendously interesting, and it is doing me a great deal of good. St. Teresa speaks so well about prayer and interior mortification, that mortification with, with which, with God's help, I am determined to reach. Since I cannot for the present impose great sufferings upon myself, I can at least immolate my will at every moment of the day. Prayer. How I love the way St. Teresa handles the subject. When she speaks of contemplation, that degree of prayer wherein God does everything and we do nothing, wherein he unites our souls to himself so intimately that it is no longer we who live but God living in us. Oh, I recognize there the moments of sublime rapture to which the Master deigned to raise me so often during that retreat, as he has done since then. What can I render to him for such great benefits? After those ecstasies, those high raptures, during which the soul forgets everything and sees only its God, how hard and trying ordinary prayer seems! How painfully one must toil to unite all one's powers! How much it costs, and how difficult it seems! God was even then raising Elizabeth to the higher states of prayer, and this was obvious when she prayed. She would be seen coming slowly up the central aisle of the parish church. She would kneel down in her place and be immediately absorbed in deep recollection. For a long time she would remain motionless, as though wholly possessed by God. Her most intimate friend was always struck by the sudden change that would come over Elizabeth the moment she entered the church to pray. She was no longer the same person. For some time she had been experiencing strange phenomena in the depths of her soul, which she could scarcely explain to herself. She felt as though she were dwelt in. When I see my confessor, she said to herself, I shall speak to him about it. It was then that she met a Dominican friar at Carmel, the meeting with whom was to give a decisive orientation to her interior life. Mother Germaine of Jesus, 
Sister Elizabeth's prioress and novice master and the author of The Souvenirs, justly remarked that this providential meeting recalls by its effects of grace that of which St. Teresa tells us in the 18th chapter of her life and in the fifth mansion of her interior castle. The saint does indeed relate how a great theologian of the order of St. Dominic, Master Bagnez, a celebrated professor at the University of Salamanca, by confirming from the doctrinal standpoint that she had experienced the divine presence within her during prayer, brought great consolation in addition to the complete security which the truth gives. When Elizabeth timidly questioned the distinguished religious as to the meaning of the movements of grace of which she had been aware for some time, and which gave her the impression of being dwelt in, Father Valet replied in the forceful, thought-provoking language that characterized him, But most certainly, my child, the Father is there, the Son is there, and the Holy Ghost is there. And, like the contemplative theologian he was, he proceeded to explain, explain further how, by the grace of baptism, the soul becomes that living temple of which St. Paul speaks, and how, together with the Holy Ghost, the whole Trinity is present in its creative and sanctifying power, making its dwelling in us, coming to abide in the most secret recesses of the soul, there to receive, in an atmosphere of faith and charity, the interior worship of praise and adoration that is due. Elizabeth was delighted with the dogmatic explanation. Since it was grace that was urging her, she could, in perfect security, yield to her interior attraction and dwell in the innermost depths of her soul. During this interview she was overcome by an irresistible movement of recollection. The priest went on talking, but he soon saw Elizabeth Catez was no longer listening. I was longing for him to be silent, she said later to the prioress. Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity is completely portrayed in this avowal, eager for si silence under the influence of the grace received. On his part, Father Valet said of this decisive hour, I saw her borne away as on a tidal wave. Elizabeth was one of those souls who, having once seen the divine light, never turned aside. From that day on, everything was transformed and illumined. She had found her way. Henceforth, no matter what happened, the Trinity was to be her whole life. <laughs>